Welcome to the Creative and Account Podcast. This podcast was created to educate people about the world of advertising and branded content from the unique lens of two professionals working on opposite sides of the spectrum. I'm Frank DeLaRoyo, CEO and Creative Director at Straight Shot Post, a full-service post-production company that focuses on branded content. My co-host, Melissa Reisman, is an account director at BBDO, one of the largest and most well-respected agencies in the world. We hope to help you navigate through the challenges you'll face daily as you develop your career or business in this dynamic and quickly evolving field. The CNA Podcast is brought to you by Straight Shot Post. Uh, We're a post-production company that uh, emphasizes project management and technology, and we use that to leverage our talents. Uh, We focus on branded content primarily. Check us out at straightshotpost.com and all of the social media platforms. Uh, We look forward to chatting with you. Shout out to Straight Shop Post for sponsoring this podcast. They're incredible. Check them out on their website at straightshotpost.com. What's up, Melissa? What's We're up, back. Dale? <laughs> I know. We're here to hammer out another episode of the CNA podcast. How you been? I'm good. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. How about you? I know. Just I think so I need knows. some coffee. <laughs> we are shooting this on a Friday night. Both of us do work as hard as we <laughs> talk about it. Um, she did just get an email from a client. That's why we had to stall for a second. Oh, geez. Thanks for throwing me under the bus there. You know, the, the, the people got to know. We uh, walk the walk, too. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a little fatigued, too. I went a little hard, I think, on the workouts this week, and it uh, took a toll on my joints. So today was kind of uh, just a rough day of recovery. But hi, we're also moving. moving You're moving, in- too? That's correct. I'm moving to Williamburgs, y'all. Don't find me. Oh, yeah, yeah. How's the house? Well, you got to say it, obviously. Let the people know. <laughs> so you're moving to Williamsburg, and I just moved. So look at us. We're both just, like, living out of boxes. <laughs> she owns a home, people. Don't let her fool you. She's got some – she owns the house. This is some adult shit. Okay. You could do that, too, if you wanted to move back to Long Island, Dale. I, I could, but I'm putting – hey, you invest <laughs> in the house. I invest in a company. and Exactly. Uh, hopefully hopefully they both work out um i think it's awesome the pictures were great you guys have a lovely backyard and so you know everybody's asking them if they should get a dog leave a comment on what kind of dog they should get for their backyard i'm definitely getting a dog i just need to convince <laughs> my husband <laughs> so if you want to leave your comments i'd love for different types but i'll be honest i at heart would just pick a dog at a shelter personally i think shelter dogs are Dogs that need a home versus uh, I don't really believe in buying dogs. I mean, I have a mutt as a cat that we found in a box outside that we just brought into our home. Obviously, he's Wait, fine. Really? Yeah, that's how Holy we got cow. our cat. Oh, my God. Yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely believe in shelter dogs, personally. Yo, let me shout out my uncle's pet apparel company, then American Pet Place, because 10% of every one of uh, their sales goes towards shelters. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, what's up? Uncle Josh, I love you. Okay, so uh, what you been watching? Any more weird serial killer sh- to let us in on? I have been watching weird weird serial killer stuff. I started watching Death with like the, like Killing the Mormons or something like that. I don't what? know if you've seen okay. that on Netflix. No. I'll be honest, I watched an episode and it took me a long time to get into it because I don't really understand the Mormon faith, nothing about it. I just like, I need to learn more about it before I, I dive in. But yeah, I started watching that. I watched Georgia and Ginny. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It got a lot of backlash. It was in the news because they made a comment about Taylor Swift and she said that she disagreed with it. And that's the reason why my sister is not watching that show. And I'm putting her out on blast. Please include that in here because I've been wanting her to watch this show. And she does not want to because Taylor Swift doesn't like it. So, Hey, man. Your sister, though. Sticking with it. (laughs) Fight the fight, Kim. Um. (laughs) that's funny i mean the only thing i i've been watching um i actually went back i don't know why for any of those of you who are anime fans out there for some reason i started thinking about full metal alchemist again probably because i was in the mood for some adult more adult stuff mm. and uh i'll try to do the layman's version basically it's in a world where alchemy is a real thing and it's it's like a cool steampunk kind of world and basically it's the story of these two brothers who are very gifted at this and they commit the greatest taboo of alchemy. They try to bring back their mother who had died. Wow. And in doing so, one of the brothers loses his arm and his leg because it's all about equivalent exchange. So you need to give something of equal value in order to get something. 
right? And the other brother loses his entire body. And uh, they save his brother by, you know, putting his, basically using alchemy to put his soul inside of a, uh, like a night suit. So it's, a, it's like this like short kid and this giant suit of armor trying to figure out how to get their bodies back. That's the premise of the show. Wow, very dark. Yes, kind of reminds me a little bit of Avengers where one soul for another soul. That's what comes to my head when I hear that. That's what's up. I'm okay with that. We're allowed to relate it. But yeah, so it's it was a sh the reason why I'll put it on is because it has a lot to do with military and conspiracy and people that you love don't make it and you know, real things happen. I was just in the mood for that. So I've been binging, I've been slamming through that. I'm already like 16 or 17 in. Can I just say sometimes you need to look at dark things or like some very heavy stuff in order to get through your day. I personally think that there's a connection between my serial killer, you know, I like watching serial killer documentaries and you're watching like about bodies that are trying to come back to life. That's <laughs> so not there's most some of the connection show. there. There's it's a beautiful show about brotherhood. There. So it's about okay. two brothers, family, you know? You're allowed to justify your very strange uh, uh, attraction towards death and murder. Um, that's fine. I'll, I'll allow it. You know why? So many people are into it. At my company, I'm the outlier. They all look at me like, wait, you don't like watching people get murdered every night? I'm like, no, I don't. So, so I me. think everyone should comment if we should have Dale watch <laughs> a serial killer documentary and we'll stream and for Dale's reaction. That's Just so you I know, like. I am not good with scary things i will jump and scream like a girl and I'll so even more for people to say <laughs> yes because i'm interested <laughs> we can drink too during it it'd be fun <laughs> <laughs> okay maybe maybe if i was uh drunk enough that's 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 the only thing and then outside of that i saw you know it's it's that it's hot it's a uh, award season so i'm catching up um and i put on my team doesn't know this. I'm going to talk about it on Monday. I watched The Sound of Metal um, mm. this week. And it's kind of like a classic indie. It's such an indie film, you know? And I haven't really seen one of those in a while. But it got me. It's about a drummer. <laughs> it's about, I won't say much. I'll just say the very basic plot. It's about a drummer who starts having hearing problems. <sighs> Ooh. Damn. Uh, oh, it's good. It's one of those. Where um, can you watch it? For you to do a little plug. That's a good -ass question. I don't know. But find a way to watch it, fam. You know, you I bought it. I ordered it for two bucks or whatever. App, iTunes, you got it. Apple Music, you got, you know, I don't know. There's no, there's, I don't think there's like a, a free place, I guess. Not a free, it's not free, obviously. Netflix isn't free. I don't think a streaming service has it, actually. That is a good question. But I did thoroughly enjoy the movie because it was in the right theme. It is definitely an indie film. It's a little slower. It's very, it's a character, super character driven guy totally kills it man so god he's the reason why the movie works and it really it delves into the deaf community in a way that i really haven't seen before and i really appreciated that i'm gonna tell you why i really loved it i loved it because i think at the heart the movie's about acceptance and i'm a stoic and it's very connected and just learning to accept your circumstances is such an important big thing for me and i think mm -hmm. that's what this movie really is about at its heart you know so freaking good. It doesn't go where you think it goes, I guess I would say that. You know, it's similar, you know, just leading into from acceptance is the fact that, you know, this episode is about working from home and kind of accepting yep. the circumstance and how we're, you know, dealing with a global pandemic, which none of us have dealt with in our lifetime. So I don't know about you, Dale, but do you want to jump in? Yeah. Nice segue. Unplanned, fam. She's just on it. Yeah. So this episode is going to be all about working from home. Uh, working remotely, I would actually just sort of broaden it to that spectrum because I don't know how you feel, but the things that I've adopted, I think even when everything's opened up, even when everything is quote unquote back to whatever, the new normal, I'm going to be doing and keeping a lot of the things that we started now through for years to come. I don't ever see, you know, Google Meets doing things like this going away ever now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I definitely think that there are some things that are going to stay moving forward personally just starting off from a client standpoint you know whenever we would have meetings with clients it would always be over the phone and i feel like that's in the past every meeting that we have with clients is face to face like this and i personally like it because you're able to see their raw reactions to things 
versus when we were to call them. They would put us on mute and probably have some conversations to themselves in a room. Uh, we get to get their real reactions, everyone there at the same time. And it's definitely a lot better. Uh, that's just one instance. And then just one other, we actually have status as a team every single day at 9.30 in the morning. And that was something that we started doing just because we wanted to level set and make sure everyone knew what the plan was for the day, knowing that we're all not in the same place. Obviously, you know, at the time on my team, we had people in seven different states. <laughs> None of us were even in the same state, but we just made sure every day at 930 say, hey, this is what I'm doing today across all my projects. And I love it. I actually feel like if I don't have that meeting in the morning, my day is out of whack. So I've gotten really used to it. You know, it's great. When, when we get into the workflow section, we have a very similar practice. And I think it's, it is funny. I'm like, how come we weren't doing this before? You know, yeah. there's, there's some things that I think have really come up like that, that, uh, you know, you got to look for the silver lining. So maybe let's just start though. You know, it's been a year. It's kind of crazy to think about it that way. You know, a year ago I was in the, uh, LIC Vayner X office, the Vayner productions office fully. They had a kitchen man. We had snacks and stuff. Like it was, it was good. It was the good life, fam. And um, yeah, I don't know what was it like by you. There was a very quiet tension that like entire week when things were getting shut down. You could just feel like the air was heavy. You know, everyone was still yeah. working. No one, you know, it wasn't as I guess maybe because you couldn't see it. You know, but there it was quietly. This this thing was building up. I would say for at least two weeks before things really just hit ahead. Yeah, same here. I mean, even the office was empty. Like you would walk down the hallway and there wouldn't be like, there'd be like two people at a desk. We found out one day that the, our full account team was still in the office, but all the creatives were working from home. So then it was so like, why are we all though? still here? I guess they just didn't tell us that they were all working from home. I think everyone was just getting so worried. Some people were taking it seriously. Some people were just like, I don't believe it. Uh, I'll be honest, toward the end, I I was getting worried about it. And it, because no one in my office was taking it seriously, they were just like, come, keep coming in, like everything's fine. And I remember the day that I left, I was like, I think that something is gonna happen. I'm gonna leave. And I remember it was like a Thursday and I'm like, I'm working from home on Friday. And everyone was like, okay, I'm gonna work from home on Friday too. So we all worked from home on Friday. And that Monday was when the entire city was shut down. So it's just, it's crazy. Sometimes I actually think, I don't know if I ever got COVID. I think that's a whole other topic, but- Everybody always, wonders that. I Everybody's know, I like, like, I got it guys. Okay, I had the sniffles <laughs> in January on the seven train and like, clearly I got it. I'm like, oh, so, I don't know. The reason why I don't know if I got it is because I was actually traveling. I was in back-to-back -back shoots in early March. I went to LA and then I ended up going to Arizona. And I was like back to back flights. And I remember everyone was just like, oh, like about this disease, like people next to me were talking about it. And uh, I just, hopefully I didn't get it. I mean, I don't know. I would say, well, you know, I took the seven train every single day. Some flushing Corona got hit really hard. They were, look, what was happening to me was I kept thinking, how is New York not getting slammed? We have the most people coming in and out. Like what is going, you know, I, I was waiting. I was just like, this seems, something seems a little odd that it's not more of an emergency. I mean, it was, it was just, I think people were really trying to figure out what to do before they started really to announce things. But very clearly in, in the office, there was a there was a commercial shoot going on. And I guess what, what it came down to, you know, it's, it's a private company, so it's just the leadership thing. And I will say that the Vayner family are very employee centric. So they like um, were very, as soon as they were could, they were on top of things, getting people out, moving people, setting people up in the right things, doing whatever they had to do to make their employees feel comfortable. That I will say. Technically, obviously, I wasn't a part of that company, but being around them certainly helped me treat my team better. Um, but, you know, there was a big shoot going on. And essentially what happened that Thursday, they were shooting and it was uh, uh, involving a child actor and that little girl started uh, coughing on set and it scared everybody to the point where a call was made to the head of production and he said, forget it, it's not worth it. And I totally super, super respect that decision. Mm -hmm. He's like, pull the plug, get everybody home. It ain't worth it. And you know, in our industry, just so you know, there's been a couple of things, you know, I was at NYU when unfortunately there was a tragedy that happened in Georgia. Somebody passed away on a film set, student. Um, we had the Sarah Jones incident. I don't know if you remember that one. They were shooting an Allman Brothers flick. Oh, really? 
and she was on a train tracks and they oh. thought first of all they didn't have a permit but they thought that no train that it wasn't working it's true and a train came through and killed this girl Wow. And it became a huge thing and opened up a whole side of our industry about, you know, oh, now you have the Teamsters. The Teamsters work their 16 hour days. They're driving home in the middle of the night. It's completely unsafe. And a lot of other stuff like that, that we were expected to do. So this was one of those things where I feel like those events had really informed how to handle this situation. And I thought it was handled probably as best as it could, but it was really eerie. And I was just running around quietly, plugging 15 drives in, trying to get all of our projects on hard drives because we were going to go local all of a sudden. You know, we work off of these big servers. So that was like the, the the big eerie challenge. And, you know, I haven't been in that office since. I mean, technically, I went back because I had to gut it and get all our stuff out of there eventually once we realized. Because I don't know about you, but I remember it was like, hey, this is oh cool. Two weeks, uh, two weeks. I'm down to work from home for two weeks. That's like at the time, that's like what was going through every, my head, you know? Yeah. I mean, for my through my head, I was supposed to get married on April 19th. So I kept on telling everyone at my job, I cannot get this virus, otherwise I won't get married. And I was being really selfish, I'll be honest. Oh, um, all right. All right. And little did I know that I wasn't getting married at that time anyways, because the pandemic was a pandemic. <laughs> it's not yeah. a two week thing. It was, um, we were still like quarant like we weren't leaving our house by that time, so. I remember, I remember that, I was like, oh, it's um, April and you know, my, my best friend is an engineer. So he was giving me the inside scoop and he was the one I remember when he called me up and said, Hey man, we're talking maybe July at the earliest. And I was like, Oh, what do you mean? man? Yeah. It was a really that, you know, and, and here in New York, you know, we're, we, we were clapping at seven every night. There was this awesome solidarity that sort of occurred like that summer is unforgettable for multiple reasons, but yeah, what an interesting way to start the year. Were you in the middle of a couple of projects? Did you have to wrap things up? Uh, we were in the middle of a camp, like about to launch a campaign. We were finishing to ship a few things. And um, then all of a sudden, because this was happening, we had to pause all of our campaigns. Obviously, I feel like it, it hurt us a lot, but also it really hurt clients a lot. You, you don't think like from a brand perspective, dealing with the pandemic and you know, people aren't just going out and thinking of your brand right away anymore. They're thinking about their health. Unless your brand is health driven, I think it made everyone have a different perspective of life. I know what a lot of brands started to do was how they were giving back and how they were, you know, talking about nurses or doctors or the people that are working countless hours to make sure everyone stays well or, or get better. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we started creating unique content that was catered toward that. And I think a lot of other brands did the same, but we tried to make ours um, very thoughtful and, and reason, make sure it has a reason for, for posting it. That was a switch hmm. for us. But. but you didn't stop at all. It sounds like it sounds like they were, you were pretty quick to shift. Yeah. I mean, pretty quick. I would say there was a week where things started to slow down, but once clients had, you know, revised plan for hmm. the next couple of months, we just kind of hit the ground running. I remember we had a COVID campaign that consisted of like, you need this amount of videos, you need this amount of radio spots and everything just started kicking back up. And we just started figuring out how to do all of this from home. It's really funny because I thought it would be a bit more difficult than I feel like it was. You don't realize, or at least in my business that, you know, all I really need is a phone and a computer and some Wi-Fi, <laughs> and I could really get my job done anywhere. The only, you know, tactically, that you do need is is keeping the relationships that you have with the creatives, with the clients, with the people on your team and making sure that everyone is still working in that same mentality. I personally liked it a lot because I would commute probably an hour, hour and a half into the office and back home. I would work until seven, eight o'clock at night in the office. I would have to try to catch a Long Island Railroad train back home. And most nights I would eat dinner at like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. So I feel like my work-life balance changed knowing that I'm already home. I could stop working at 8, but at least I don't have to travel, you know, an hour to try to catch a train and, and come back. So I feel like it's it's better for me, but I'm, I also could be an outlier just knowing that, you know. I think many people have city. that experience though. I, I know... I mean, it's funny, you know, I'm a firm believer that we're creatures of habit, that I treat myself with a lot of humility. I know I'm human. I know I'm flawed. I know I'm very manipulable. Um, as soon as the habit of going to work every morning 
dropped, every other good habit also started to disappear. I was definitely not as productive. I definitely, my workout routine, which was because a lot of my morning routine was centered around the time that I had from when I woke up to when I got on the train. So there was this kind of ticking clock for me to get stuff done before that. I left the house. Once that wasn't a thing, I just, oh, I guess I can work out later. And then I just didn't work out. Oh, I guess I can just, you know, start working at noon again, like when I was in my freelancing days or whenever I wanted to. And it was, you know, very quickly did I go back to my old ways, which I purposefully changed because there were better ways. So um, it just, it was a very impressive, the pull and distraction that home life had on me on the side of commuting. I specifically moved, you know, as a 20 minute door to door commute. So it didn't ever, it was actually a nice breath. It was not, which I understand because I did commute from Long Island too. It was not that, you know, where you have to be on the heated train. Sometimes if you hit that rush hour train, you have to stand. I hated that. It was just, I get it. For some reason, I was always exhausted when I took the train. And I never understood that. I was just like, I think I think it's just the vibe of whatever it is, commuter life, you know? So I totally, I totally understand that. But I do know for a lot of people, there was just a total loss of their structure. And, mm -hmm. you know, work for a lot of people gives them purpose. Uh, my mm -hmm. uncle uh, was furloughed. You know, I guess the other thing we didn't talk about is, you know, you kept your job and you were able to keep working. That was a big thing. So you probably, a lot of people who are not fortunate enough to be in that situation, I maybe I'll talk about it because technically I lost my job because I own a company and there was no work. So that I could tell you what it felt like, but it, it took me about a month to even decide because I guess I was waiting. Oh, it's going to, don't worry, we'll get back in the office and I'll be fixed again. Um, and then I, when the reality came that that wasn't going to happen, I was like, all right, no one's going to fix you but you, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, but I went home. I was home with my family. Uh, spent all of May there. It was lovely because I did get to take a break. It wasn't by choice, but it was a very nice break. You know, the pool opened up in the back. My dad was making sandwiches, you know. I was, I started stretching and doing a little bit of some certain, I will say working out outside in the morning. And at the time I was doing, uh, I do calisthenics. So I was really a beginner. So it was just like diamond pushups, squ air squats, you know, just, I, I, I grabbed literally like bags of rice for Puerto Rican, like bags of rice and was like using that as weights to do some, <laughs> some, some back workouts, some, some rowing. And like, that was it. And it was nice really nice to be outside and have space but it only lasted so long you know mm -hmm. were you around any family in the beginning in the very beginning i'll be honest so my fiance at the time because we weren't married we were both working at home in a one bedroom uh so he was working on one side i was working on the other we both weren't going into the office so thankfully we were able to work from home we really weren't seeing anyone except for family so we would see um, Zach's side of the family, my fiance, we would see their family like every other weekend or so. And then I would see my sister in the beginning, just knowing that um, we actually weren't the ones that were going out to work still. Like she wanted to make, cause she just had a baby. So she wanted to make sure that, you know, obviously I'm staying at home and being safe. So we did go see her at the very beginning. And then yeah. she's a, yeah. also, you know, um, for those of you who don't know, Melissa's sister is a teacher too. Um, so there was, I guess, some good timing because the school year was ending anyway. She wasn't working. She had just had a baby. So, but I do know she took it very seriously. Yeah. No, she would. did. But at the same time, like being a new mom in a pandemic, like one, being a new mom is already hard enough because you don't know what you're doing. So you do normally tend to have other people around you to kind of help you figure out what to do when your baby screams when like they do something and you don't really know what to do. But I'll be honest, I give, my, you know, my sister and my brother in law a lot of props for doing a lot of it on their own in the very beginning. They didn't yeah. see a lot of family. I was lucky enough to go over just because I wasn't seeing anyone. Even my parents, I remember for months, they didn't even get to see their own granddaughter. Like that's yeah. so hard. They would actually have to see her from, you know, a window because my sister didn't want them to touch her. Yep. It's just, it's, it's mind blowing, you know, and when we look up back on this, hopefully in five, 10 years, when this is well behind us, it's just, it will, 2020 will hands down be a year. None of us will ever forget for multiple reasons, but I don't think I ever want my sister or anyone else to go through, you know, you not being able to hold someone close to your family, a new baby that everyone's so excited about because of a, a virus. 
Yeah, you know, oddly enough, the last people that I saw before the shutdown, I was Kim and PJ and Olivia. I held Olivia like it was like the day she got back from the hospital. I held her daughter in my hands. And then literally the next time I saw her in person, she was a little person all of a sudden. It was crazy. And the same thing because my other best friend also had a newborn. And both of their kids had their one-year-old birthdays through Zoom. It's cute, but it's like every time I see them, so much has changed. And I'm like, man, I wish, uh, you know, th there's a lot that time is just flying by. Silver linings, you know, you get to spend more time with certain people. I mean, it was not, like I said, I enjoy being able to be with my family, but pretty quickly I got antsy. Pretty quickly I was like, I can't, this can't be it. I did have to let go of my my awesome AE. Shout out Shalimar if you ever hear this. She was great and uh, she ended up, uh, getting COVID and her girlfriend got it and she ended up having to go home to Virginia to be with her mom. And I totally respect that. And like, yeah, it was heartbreaking. You know, she came and had to drop off equipment and I never got to say goodbye. She just dropped it off in front of my door and left. And I'm ne I may never see her again. And I think that's, that's something that it's like, geez, you know, that's the reality of what it is. So I, I went through the same thing. Most small businesses went through, we shut everything down. When I came back, I guess the biggest lesson, a takeaway, whatever you want to call it, is like it really does start with you and end with you. And, you know, I don't know. It's hard. You know, it's it's such a, it's a mentality thing, honest, is what mm -hmm. I really think it is. And it really does. It, when I decided, OK, I'm going to rebuild my company, I was committed and I knew what to do. Right. In terms of forming new habits and building new routines, the fear of like just the work that it takes to do that just was you know it's a little, a little slow mm -hmm. but when i really dug into it i mean yeah i read two books about habit forming i hired a personal assistant first before even an editor and we audited my whole life top to bottom my finances my eating my workouts my relationships everything figured out you cut some people out of your life you know, I'm not the best with maintaining relationships, actually. So it was fine. Like my close friends were my close friends. There were definitely some people that, that when I finally called them, like my homeboy, Ruba Joe, when I finally called Joe, I was like, bro, I don't know how I didn't call you weeks ago. Are you okay? like, what's up, brother? Are you all right? And he was supposed to get married, too. And they pushed their, their wedding a year. So there were some things like that. But I was very, I just was like, all right, I'm focused now. And I sort of, that was the real thing is I really started to do that. There were some things that I did pick up, some practical things for people. Number one, you gotta you gotta create a workspace. I don't know if that was a thing you had to do. Like that was big. Like this is now the uh, you guys are in it. By the way, this is this zone, this little strip right here. This is for those of you who are watching on YouTube and can see it. This is my office and my gym, and it's designated and broken up by where the couch ends, <laughs> <laughs> and where the pull-up bar ends, and my and but that you can't see over here. On, in this little like uh, archway, right? So that was it. And I dedicated it. I was like, this is it. When I come in here, I have to, that's what I have to do. That was a big deal. I don't know if like you ended up saying, I made a little home for your work. I feel like, I mean, you're hundred percent right. Having a steady routine, even though you're not going back into the office, um, definitely helps you get into the right mentality. I unfortunately, didn't have that. I actually worked at my kitchen table for almost the full year until I just moved here. Uh, so I was working at a kitchen table sitting on a hardwood chair and uh, I just like kept going and I kind of forgot that I was like, that I was at my kitchen table, but I just made it my place. Um, but it was much better than sitting you were at able a couch. to stay focused. Yeah. I mean, you're crazy. She's crazy. I'm crazy. I, yeah. Yeah, I know I'm crazy, but that's because I also didn't have the space Dale. Like I lived in a one bedroom where it was the kitchen, one bedroom, the bathroom and the living room. I was working mm. in the living room slash kitchen. Yeah. Cause so I, I made it work because that was all we had. And I just recently moved into a house where now for the first time in my life, I have my own office, hey. which it feels so much better. I now know what you're talking about because now I have my own space. So yeah. I totally agree with you, but I feel like you also have to, you know, figure out what works best for you. I'll be honest. And I disagree if anyone says it, working on your couch is not a good routine. <laughs> Cause for me, if you work yep. on your couch, you're just going to get lazy. You're going to be like, Oh, let me put on the TV. And that's how you start bad habits. So totally agree with you. I think starting, you know, whether it be my kitchen table or whether it be a desk, like for you, it, it's definitely a good start. I think in both in both cases, though, it was a space where there wasn't that many other things to do. 
you know, um, because I will say like the, the habit that's hard for me to break is when I break for lunch and I do sit on my couch, getting back off to come back becomes very difficult. Yep. Right. So I tend, I really understand that. And I want to also emphasize that the starting a routine or and building one again was also critical. So was that a cat? You have a kitty cat nearby? Oh, <laughs> y'all, y'all wish that you were watching this, this episode right now. So, well, there you go, guys working from home, baby. This is <laughs> life. Um, I would say the other big thing was after we did that audit, taking the baby steps to start to implement it. The sleep routine has always been hard for me. Getting to bed at the right time has just never been easy. And waking up early has never been easy, but I started to work on that. I mean, a huge, huge, huge thing was starting to work out again. Working out every morning has been one of the greatest things I ever decided to commit to in my life for the mental benefits more than the aesthetic or physical ones. No doubt about it. And what I did with Amaris, shout out my awesome assistant is we before work started 10 to 6 it was just me and her in the beginning fun fact the only time i've ever seen her in person was in a mask as we had to move all the computer gear from my old business partner's apartment back to mine and that was it and then we had to gut that office that was heartbreaking because we loved that spot and yeah we would get in and the rule was work starts at 10 but her and i were going to get together at 9 45 and just either get out some bullshit whatever was in my head and, and go through the day. Um, and so now I, I had that ticking clock back that I so desperately needed. And, and I had an accountability partner. Sure enough, those things for anyone who knows about habit building are good. I also made it very easy. As you can see, the dip bars are here. The pull-up bars literally on my way into the living room. So I did all the things that are in Atomic Habits and obviously it works. So slowly but surely it worked. Then we started interviewing, picked up an assistant editor and, and took it from there. But I had no work. And the work that I, so like, obviously right when the pandemic hit, I was finishing a few projects and luckily I have a workstation from home. Then there was nothing. The first project I did back and I'd love to hear what was like the first big thing you did. The first thing I did back was these Father's Day ads for Old Spice. Mm -hmm. And it was Zoom calls from basketball players talking to either their mentors or their fathers or their coaches for Father's Day. I did like, it was like a series of four or five of those with different, uh, players very cool did you get sucked into zoom zoom land zoom productions i've i mean i'm i've had one in two weeks <laughs> i feel like it's just become um human nature you know what's funny is we've actually been doing quite a lot of shoots from you know while you're working from home just because it's easier for everyone to not have to you know commute all the way there even though you don't necessarily need everyone on set i can't remember the first shoot that we had i'll be honest just because they're all blending in together because we do them so frequently but we do a lot of obviously tabletop knowing that i work on duncan uh so we work with some of the same vendors uh and they're all incredible they've you know make sure everything is safe on set obviously we don't have talent because the talent is yeah. food uh That's so convenient. we're lucky enough there but separately you know i don't know if you've seen any duncan live action spots but we did have a fair share of live action spots obviously before the pandemic so knowing that you know obviously shooting live action is a bit more tricky nowadays you know the brand had to kind of change their approach um, you're not seeing a lot more, you know, live action spots out there because if you do shoot with a person, you know, you're more susceptible to getting them exposed to COVID and you have to sign a few forms. I don't know if you've dealt with that or, or seen that in your experience, but it's just a lot easier to do either an animated approach or, you know, a tabletop. We used to do a lot of data management work on set. So the few times that We've been asked to do that. Um, yeah, you know, you have to get the, the rapid test and all those things. A lot of, I would say our industry moved as quickly as it could. Um, yeah. But yeah, so in the beginning learning, I mean, I was literally teaching my clients how to use screen capture software. We had different people on different IP addresses screen capturing because if one person's internet went down, you need we had redundancy in, in this whole system and we only had the athletes for a short amount of time. I learned a lot about that experience, especially because I was editing it on a plastic table in my parents' den and they were wa trying to watch the news and would yell and fight and whatever normal people do. And I'm like, guys, you, like, I, you know, I kind of, I have a, <laughs> I'm going to get on the phone with Old Spice in a second. Can you, can you not, you know, please? <laughs> so, so it, that was, that was like, 
I think everybody was going through things like that. I mean, I don't have pets, so I didn't have to do that or no young kids. But I would say that the industry did what it could. We did, we were very slow, but any any special asset we had were, you know, was being used. It was a lot of consulting. People were asking me how how do I do this or that with, with the limitations that they had. And so we had to learn and pick up things quickly. But honestly, I, I really would go back and just say, like, if, if you're struggling to work from home, you need to force yourself into a routine, whatever it is. And you need to write it down and you need to find a way to commit to it. And you need to form those habits because, you know, that loss of purpose that happens when people lost their jobs and stuff, like my uncle really went through that, mm-hmm. takes a while to bounce back from it. It takes a while. You have to be easy on yourself, okay, mm-hmm. as, you, as you start to rebuild these things. I, I would say that's like a huge thing. I messed up. I mean, I still mess up all the time, but you know, being able to like do that, like I'll give you a good, a good thing we started doing recently. And I, Maris is going to kill me because I, I really keep forgetting what it's called, but there's that thing on your iPhone that you can limit your app time. Do you know yes. what I'm talking about? No, you're talking about. I start doing that now. So really? Uh, like, yeah. So I like all social media goes off at 11 at night and then during the workday, I can turn it off too. Yeah. It's not easy if you're like, Oh, I wouldn't do that. Well, personally, I, I mean, I get it. I mean, if it works for you, that's good. But I'll be honest, like I'm not on my phone from like nine o'clock until 730 most times because I'm working. So for me, my one break of the day, I need a social media detox. So I'd love to scroll on TikTok and know what's going on on that stupid app. (laughs) So but that's Uh, fine. But the thing is, but somehow, but this is, you know, I don't have that amount of self-control. I mean, it might look like I do now, but no, I just forcefully (laughs) limited myself. You know, if I could control it, maybe, but this is an easier way. Now I don't so even that, have a choice. Do you limit your text messages too, or is it just apps? No, no, no. Well, you know, I'm in client services, so I have to keep communications open, but things that would completely take me for away, you know, the Facebooks and Twitters and Instagrams, those things good, go down. Technically, I'll put them up, you know, you can break, I'll break it because I'm checking our content daily. But I do limit myself, especially at night, because I realized one of the most important things for me was if I didn't get a good night's sleep, it would really mess up that whole morning routine. So I know at 11, it's all got to go off. And the only thing I really can do is read. So that's what I do. Nice. So that's why you weren't responding to all of my Instagram messages, Dale. The truth finally comes out. (laughs) Okay. I'm also hate social. I hope that's, yeah, (laughs) yes. You're so right. It's this. This is this habit of mine that I'm trying to break. Um, yes. So, um, but yeah, once we got going, I mean, you know, it took a lot uh, to figure out. I'd love to hear, uh, we're going to bounce it back around. I think we should talk about workflow here. What have I discovered, you know, outside of the personal, obviously, which I think, guys, it's really is about treating yourself humbly and understanding what your limitations are. There are many tools out there to help you do the things that you want to do. I understand not everybody can hire a personal assistant to help them to force themselves into the things they want to do. That's fine. But like I said, use technology, use these apps, use your communities. You yeah. I, I think it's all about knowing what your resource is because you know necessarily what you're looking for. So Dale, you reached out to someone who necessarily helped you get right back on your path. I think, you know, it depends on where, you know, if you're still not doing well with working from home, you have to start thinking, what's the reason why you're not doing well is because you're not, you know, talking to people on a daily basis. Is it because you're having a hard time focusing? Yeah. So I, it's self-awareness and also knowing your resources, I think. Yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, it's funny. Remember when we were at the baptism and I was, we, we started shooting the shit about work again. This was like late in the summer. At that point when I had worked things out, it was funny. I'm talking to everybody at this baptism. Everybody's going, oh man, I gained 15 pounds and this and that, or I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling depressed. Everybody was going through that. It felt weird to be the guy at the party that was like, well, I lost weight. I have more people working for me now than I did before. And I'm happy still somehow. And I realized just going through that, not that it was not, first of all, last year was the, by far the most difficult year of my life. It was also probably one of the best years of my life. I think by virtue of that adversity. So it's so it's funny because like, it's the same for me too, but in a different way. Mm. Well, you, why? Why what? was last year? So, why? Why was last year so special for you? I got married. <laughs> Woo! I had to, guys. I had to lead her up. Come on, come on. 
But also not only that, Dale, it was, I agree with you. It's more about persevering and like making the best out of a year that no one is going to, you know, like looking back on it, but at least we can go back and look on that year and say that we made the best of it. Also at the end of last year was when, you know, we started looking for a house and we got our offer accepted in November and, you know, that was huge for us. So it was awesome. The fact that we were able to get married and get a house so quickly you know, we're forever thankful for that. And I feel like obviously we have two different approaches to why, you know, we made the best out of the year. But um, at the time when I saw you at the baptism, I was not at that place yet because I was still, you know, upset that there was a global pandemic and I wasn't sure if I was going to have my wedding. Again, I was being selfish, but for any bride that is listening to this (laughs) um, and is planning a wedding during a pandemic, you you kind of have to be selfish because it's kind of all up to you at this point. So I guess I can bring this up. I remember saying to you at the baptism that you won the quarantine, Dale, because you lost weight and you, you know, kind of made the best out of, you know, a, a situation that all a lot of people weren't doing well in, you know, a lot of people were having a really hard time not talking to people and like they were dealing with some, you know, a lot of stuff. And you came into the party like, I'm doing great, guys. And I was I was so pumped for you. I remember I like gave you a high five and I like gave you a drink and I was like, cheers, man. Like, I'm excited for you. And now look at us. We're making a podcast. Yeah, you're damn right. I mean, the reality is like um, I live in New York. I have a family to go home to to take me in for four weeks to help me recharge tell me I could do it, whatever I want to do to, to say the right things to me. So yes, uh, we face loss. And, and, and I obviously I lost my company. I, that's, that's a real thing. I was terrified that the thing that I had put it, you know, all of my life into was never going to happen and not necessarily it's look, it's, this is what sucks. Okay. I'm, a, I'm just somebody who wants agency. So if my business was going to fail, if it's because of me, that's fine. I, you know, I accept that. I made my mistakes, didn't track my money, hired the wrong people, whatever it would have been. I get that. But there, the pandemic, there are so many businesses that were doing everything right and they still failed now. That That's what hurts me as a, as a business owner to other small business owners out there. Like my heart is, is it's that's the one thing that does make me tough. That it's really tough to think about. Not to mention, let's not, let's not neglect the protests and sort of the other awakenings that like our country had last year and the election and everything that happened that really made this this whole year such a a unique one in our history but i i would say that you know when we talked as a team it was remarkable how with all of that going on when i asked them what they were thankful for on thanksgiving when we talked about ourselves on new year's what our resolutions were everybody was grateful for just a few things they were just grateful that they had a family or somebody to talk to they were grateful that they all just had a job someplace to go every day and an outlet to to speak that's why we do our Monday morning meetings because I realized that during this time, like what el- who else and where else is that happening for them? And I wanted to make sure that people were keeping their eyes on the, on the long term, which is like, are you doing what you can every day to make yourself happy, to further yourself and whatever goals you have. And basically regardless of the situation that you're in, there are things you can do. That's, that's what I was trying to do during the pandemic is focus on what can I do instead of sort of being afraid of the unknown or, you know, just sitting there thinking about all the things that, that were taken away. Uh, mainly because it's not productive. That's kind of, you know, in, in in its most simplest form. But yeah, it is wild. And there was a lot of loss and there was a lot of pain. And that pain did not stop. Your brother-in-law, my dear friend, lost his father the day after Thanksgiving. You know, I just lost another family member a few weeks ago. And it has been incredibly difficult to do those things, to be at a funeral, not be able to go and hug or, or give somebody a kiss. And we're Puerto Rican, man. That's part of who we are. So you know, I'm with, I get that even still, I, I really do it. It's all about you. And if you can find a way to keep your eye on the prize, I think, I think that's the biggest advice that I would have for working from home. Treat yourself humble, limit the things that you need to limit, control your environment and, you know, make sure that you know why you're doing it. Have, have that reason. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the CNA podcast. If this brought you any value, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You know how much it means.